out here in the perimeter, there are no stars. Out here, we is stoned, immaculate. Hello and welcome. This is the C86 Show. I'm David Eastall. As you know, we love a special guest. This week, it's going to be the turn of the singer-songwriter David Ford, who I spoke to very recently to find out more about life, love, poetry. One-time member of the band Easy World, but has gone on to a very successful solo career and wrote a book a few years ago, which is also worth tracking down and reading. Anyway, this is the interview. Just a little bit of a heads up. I realised there was a little bit of a technical glitch, he says, shouting. Actually, my microphone is a bit quiet, so you can't hardly hear me, which might be a good thing, but uh, thankfully you can hear David, so that's the main thing. So look, after several minutes of casual chat, we got down to the exciting subject that was the early formative years. David, it's over to you. I did. Uh, well, I, I guess I had two, really. Um and the, the the first the first one is is I suppose fairly pertinent for today because apparently thirty years ago today, uh, automatic for the people by REM came out and I was mm. I was a teenager at the time I was I was just sort of towards the end of of being at school so I was like fourteen or something uh, oh no what would, yeah yeah I would have been fourteen or forty four now um, and uh, I just absolutely loved that that. That record, I suppose I grew up in Eastbourne, so we never, from that day to this, at no point have we ever had any sort of live music scene. There's never been any sort of like, a, you know, countercultural anything in, in, in my town. So, so I sort of wasn't exposed to, uh, you know, I, I sort of, I sort of didn't know what was going on out, out in, the, in the wide world. So, um, I mean, I think I said in, in my book that when when Kurt Cobain died, like I was I was exactly that that generation that should have been all over that. I'd never heard of him. I, I heard about it on the news because like, I don't know who that guy was. But, you know, I was like 15 at the time. So I really should have been, you know, that, that should have been a really big moment in my life. Anyway, I digress. Um, yeah. Automatic of the People was I just I just really loved it. It was the first time that that songs really uh connected with me and I and I was I just found it really fascinating and sort of the, those sort of quite opaque lyrics and the and the quite sort of I suppose sad minor key acoustic guitar moments but with this sort of like indie sensibility I just found it really interesting it was it was it was very educational to to, to the young me and got me really into the idea of, of songs and and that songs weren't just there for for sort of shallow entertainment that that they could also be sort of um deep and work on other levels as well yeah. so that was that was awakening number one as a as a teenager and then and then a few years after that um after i'd been a yeah i'd, I'd been a, a musician you know, as as a job for five years or so and um my uh, i went to a record fair while I was on tour with my band and I, I bought a Tom Waits uh, DVD of a, of a live performance of his. And we watched it in our, in our tour bus. We had a, a yes. VCR. No, it wasn't VCR. I did DVD play. It, it wasn't quite that long ago. Yeah. So we, we watched this thing and I was just, I was like astonished. It was like the most amazing thing I'd ever seen. I was like, this is, this is, the future even though it was from you know from 1978 um and and the my bandmates were just like what the fuck is this it is awful and and <laughs> i think I, I in my mind i quit the band that day there was that i'm out we're done i am i am i'm bound for for other other places yeah and so yeah so so yeah so rem sort of introduced me to the idea of, of sort of songs being able to do things other than just you know get stuck in your head and, and hum along to and then and then I suppose Tom Waits sort of just showed me that there's more you can do with songs and and performance and, and I suppose character I suppose because a lot, a lot of his stuff was uh is very is very theatrical I don't mean sort of you know jazz hands theatrical it's it, it involves a lot of um you know characterization I suppose which uh Again, when when I was younger, I, I I thought my future was going to be as an actor. I I I went to university to try and you know go down that road. Right. Didn't, didn't work out so well. I I, I dropped out and, and 
join the band instead. But yeah, for, for a while there, I thought I wanted to, that the acting was, was going to be my thing. And I suppose discovering Tom Waits sort of connected the dots and sort of it all came full circle. I was like, oh, actually, you know, singing songs is kind of an acting gig. Like you adopt a persona, you take on a character and you try and communicate, you know, the, the emotions to the audience. And it all sort of, you know, made sense to me. And, that, and I, I sort of feel that's how I've been doing it ever since. Yes. Well, I, I, yes. Tom Waits had a great impact on us during the 80s, I suppose. There was a track in the neighbourhood and downtown train, which just had that evocativeness. And with um, Automatic for the People, did that have Night Swimming and Everyone Hurts on it? I can't That's remember. right, yeah. Right, yes, that was their kind of massive breakthrough. I mean, they yeah. were really good in the 80s, but then suddenly mm. they it all came together, which was amazing because most bands that I interviewed, as you can imagine, you know, have the three albums, well, if they're lucky. Um, but R.E.M. had this incredible lifespan, you know, and, yeah. and, and it just kept sort of progressing. I suppose... To some extent, so did you too. Yeah, and interested. Did you come from a kind of a musical family at all? Because obviously, no. No, not, not at all. I, I, I uh, my, my, my grandmother on her deathbed told me that her mother was an opera singer, but she was saying some very strange things at the time. So, so possibly, possibly my great grandmother sang opera, but I, I've, I've no idea whether that's true or not. But as, as far as I'm aware, I'm the only musically inclined person in my family. So you didn't, your parents weren't, you know, hip to the trip. You know, they hadn't seen the Beatles or the Rolling Stones in the in '63 or anything like that. Uh, no, they, they, you know, they, they liked music, but I wouldn't say, that, you know, they. They were occasional gig goers. I mean, my 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 dad sort of liked. Um, what was he into? He he kind of liked, you know, prog stuff. He liked Pink Floyd a lot, um, and uh, you know, he 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 liked sort of mainstream guitar blues music, that that kind of thing. So you know, there was a lot of Eric Clapton in the house when I was when I was growing up there. My mum my was, I guess, more into. She liked. Um, I guess singer songwriters a bit more. Like they they both really like Bowie. Um, um, my mum likes like you know Don McLean and Cat Stevens and 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 fellas like that. So so I I heard a bit of that stuff. Me yes, you can't go wrong with those, can you? Really, let's face it. Especially early Cat Stevens stuff. Yeah. Don't they? Yes. So when you went to Manchester to do drama studies, yeah, was Manchester there because of the whole Manchester thing that you had been reading about in Eastbourne, thinking? I must go there because it's going to be brilliant. Well, kind of. So it was, so that would have been 96, which was, I suppose, the height of, you know, it was Britpop rather than Manchester, I guess. It was, it, so it was more, I mean, in fact, that was the year the Hacienda shut while I, while I was there. So, so it was, it was more, I suppose, Oasis were more, were more, more the thing than, um, than Happy Mondays or whatever. Um, and, but I wasn't really into any of that. I, I, I think I thought it would be exciting to go to Manchester because, because I was musically inclined at the time. I, I thought it would be, you know, a really interesting place to, to, to be around. But I mean, I mean, I was so broke, I couldn't afford to do anything or go anywhere or, or anything while I was there. And, um, and weirdly, I, I, you know, I had, a, I had a band back home in Eastbourne. So I, I found myself commuting from you know probably the the capital of of british guitar band music back home to eastbourne in sussex to, to go and actually you know play music on the weekends and i yeah i was i was coming home at the weekends to and i had a girlfriend in in eastbourne as well and so i and i it was around that time that i, I realized i didn't really want to be an actor anyway I, I wanted to do something else so so my heart wasn't in manchester but yeah it was it was if my heart had been in it, it would have been a really cool place to be, I'm sure. Yes. God, that's interesting. You were talking about being so broke because because the 90s, that period, you know, we'd had quite a bit of a recession in the early 90s, the John Major period. And mm. then towards Teen Tony and New Labour, you know, things just seemed to sort of open up so much, didn't they? There was this kind of sudden money was suddenly everywhere. Not necessarily in my life or yours, but there just seemed to be this optimism in the 80s. Because most of the indie bands I have interviewed from that period, you know, the early 80s, there was this huge amount of unemployment. I think this is why there was a lot of bands, because it was like you could just claim the doll, Job Seekers Alliance, Enterprise Alliance schemes, all that kind of things. It's like, oh, just go on that scheme. 
mm. we won't even bring you in for an interview just you know to get off the books really and then yeah. just kind of go and play music get stoned and, and drink lots and record a few singles and hope to get on the John Peel show that was kind of why I'm sure that's why there are so many indie bands from that period now um, <clears throat> and it kind of worked but um, I sort of thought by the 90s when you were at Manchester it would have been slightly like yes the optimism in, was in the air there wasn't much optimism in the 80s by the way yeah, no, I mean, I, I, I suppose I was a bit, I was, I was a child in the 80s, so, so the, the 80s were, you know, I, I wasn't aware of anyone having any money or not, you know, but back then. It was, it was only in, uh, in fairly recent years that it's, it's occurred to me, we were actually quite poor growing up. I sort of hadn't really clocked it at the time that, um, you know, that we, we didn't really have a lot when I was young. It was, you know, I just, you just, I think, I think everyone at that age just presumes everyone's life is the same as your life. So, you know, we weren't, we weren't to know any better. Um, but I, I think that it's interesting what you were saying about being on the dole. I'm, I'm certainly aware that, yeah, in, in the 80s, like being on the dole was, was really important to a lot of uh, musicians coming up. It was a way that you could essentially support your creativity without having to you know, compromise so much, and and you could you could devote a lot of time to it, and 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 it's kind of interesting. I, I do I do wonder the extent to which it ends up paying paying itself back when when you are able to encourage people to make a cultural impact later on in life, and then actually take on a significant significant tax burden. You know, as as their success becomes apparent, I would I would suggest that letting people go on the dole to fulfill their musical ambition is probably actually a quite a good use of uh, public money. Um, but interestingly, in the, in the 90s, uh, when, when I dropped out of Manchester and, and came back to Eastbourne and we, we started a band called Easy World, we, we entirely got our, our break um, thanks to that government initiative of uh, New Deal for Musicians, oh, right. which, which our bass player, signed up for that and got put with a music industry advisor who found us a manager who ultimately got us our first record deal and that you know without that we probably would have just been playing pubs in Eastbourne but but, but um that level of kind of professional advice really helped to sort of tick us on to the to the next level yeah. so so in that regard and I, I think I think that was a you know a, one of Blair's new labour initiatives i think so so that that certainly that certainly did a job for us i think i think if i i, I might have got this completely wrong but i do seem to remember alan mcgee once saying that he was in some meeting with these politicians putting through some bill and it was all sort of you know one of those kind of watching politicians in action and sort of just pushing something through even though the the vote was generally going against it Someone just said, oh, sod it, we're just going to push it through and make mm. this happen. And it was kind of a major thing. But you, I think you, it's an interesting one about that sort of giving people a couple of years to say, well, just have a go, you know, play the doll. It's, you know, I don't know, it was 35, 35, 40 pounds a week. I mean, you got, you know, housing benefit and council tax pay. But most people did try, you know, they played lots of gigs. They would have spent lots of money getting equipment. They went into studios. It was kind of all part of a kind of industry. And then you got that single press. And then, you know, in luckily in the old days, we had John Peel. And so you had the John, a lot of people had the John Peel sh session. As long as it sounded a bit odd and quirky, you know, he would play it. And that was yeah. kind of a ne next leg up. And then you get from the John Peel session, you know, the first album and the little tour bus and all these things you realize that are kind of an industry, aren't they? You know, the sort of yeah. going around to all these venues. And every city and town in the UK, which is a tiny place, as you can imagine, having been around the world, probably, is that everyone has an alternative night, don't they, mm, in the old yeah. days, so Monday, Tuesday or Wednesday. So everyone just would do this little circuit for a few years and yeah. get to the second or third albums. And you just realise, well, actually, that's that's created a lot. And everyone generally goes on to do something else within the music industry or you become mega famous. But the mega famous doesn't really happen a lot, as you as you can imagine. But, you know, it does create a lot of kind of energy. And um, I think that's good for the great for the economy, really. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I suppose and anyone who's been doing it a long time sort of harks back to the olden days and thinks that it was that much better now. But I, I have I have great fondness of, of 
of the early days. For us, it wasn't it wasn't John Peel so much. It was um, Steve Lamac was was um, was our guy at uh, radio who was who who actually played our stuff and, and knew who we were and, and was very supportive. Um, and yeah, and we, and we would we would play those those toilet gigs up and down the country, and I absolutely loved them. And you know, they. I mean, we we called we called them toilet gigs, but with with a great deal of affection. Like they were, I mean, I mean, by by modern standards, they were they were, they were heavenly. Like a lot of the places, you know, they were they're actually incredibly well run, well attended, well loved places, and that, that sounded good. And um, yeah, I, I, I'm I'm and there's so many of them aren't there anymore. Like I think the the Leicester Charlotte was always a, a, yes, a real favourite. The, the Charlotte, the Duchess in Leeds. Yeah. Norwich had the Arts Centre. Yeah. That's yeah, still going, Norwich Arts Centre. It is. Yes, yeah. I'm in, yes, I'm, I'm actually in Norwich. All right. Yeah, okay. that, that's still going well. And there's a few other places. But then you get you get your sort of band together. You change your name from Beachy Head to Easy World. And you get on the Fierce Panda label, don't you? Yeah. The great Simon Williams. Yeah. Yeah, it was it was it was it was great. I mean, uh, and and happened so seemingly very quickly and easily. Uh, but but I suppose that is that was the model of of Fierce Panda. They could move incredibly quickly. So a lot of the stuff that they put out was was bands who who were about to or had already signed with major labels. That process takes such a long time of of you know lawyering and 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 getting everything set up to to become a big deal and in the meantime he could he could have you signed and have your record out in two weeks because because they're just it was just done on a, on a handshake and on like well let's do it then and so um yeah it was kind of like that with us all like we we had a meeting with him and he was like yeah let's put a record out and so we 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 ended up doing a doing a single and an album and and fierce panda didn't really do a lot of albums in fact in fact us, us was one of the very few albums that came out on fierce panda um is but yeah. better, better ways to self-destruct. Yeah. Oh damn! Have you read his book? I've not. No. Oh, it's quite something actually. <laughs> it's like it's really amazing, but he has this whole bit that goes through it where he um yeah he goes to commit suicide. It's so heavy. Oh wow! Yes, <laughs> it's it is amazing, but you know it's like. It makes you, it's kind of really heavy. Oh, it's heavy. But yeah, he's, he's an amazing. I did an interview with him. He's just such a lovely guy, isn't he? Mm. You know, so, um, yeah, so that was, um, so did you just have the one deal for the, the um, with Fierce Panda, you know, the sort of album, and then you were off to Jive Records? Yeah, well, I mean, again, it's it's not, it doesn't, it's not really like a deal. You, it's almost like a conversation. It's like, do you want to put a record up? Yeah, let's put a record out. Do you want to do another one? Yeah, we'll do another one. And then it was, and then you know, there was somebody else putting our records out. So we we didn't we didn't do it with Simon anymore. It was a very it was very informal, you know. I I think a lovely way of, of putting music out, quite frankly. Yeah. So just you know, you go. Do you fancy doing this? Yeah, let's do it. And and it happens. What was your yes? Because in the book, your book that you wrote on Jive, it sounds like suddenly it's quite a different gig, isn't it? When you when you enter this world of a major re record label. And Jive Records, because I can remember they were quite dance orientated, weren't they? They were, they were very pop in the UK. Uh, well, actually, um, everywhere. So our, our label mates were Britney Spears, Justin Timberlake, NSYNC, Backstreet Boys, uh, Steps, and Easy World. It was it was pretty much that w w was the was the stable. Oh, and R. Kelly, remember him? Um, yes. Ooh. So Ooh, they all ended so well, didn't they? Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, so it was it was an odd it was an odd roster to be to be alongside, but it, it was it was part of them trying to shift gear or to, or to have I, I don't know I think I think we were weirdly an attempt at them trying to get a bit of um, credibility and and you know get some I don't know uh, indie credentials, but. It was it was it was it was a really strange mismatch for everyone because of course the way that they the only way that they knew to 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 promote and to and to have these acts was was to treat them like a like a very mainstream pop thing which they did with us even though it wasn't appropriate. Um, 
so it was it was never it was never likely to end that well plus there was the fact that very shortly after we we started with jive the process started of them being swallowed up by the bmg sony empire um so that was yeah so that that cloud was hanging over the whole time anyway yes and how did the dynamic of the band cope because you'd been together for quite a few years by at this stage as well so you must have felt like god we've we've got the major major deal but actually there's a bit of a back black cloud on the horizon i don't think we saw the cloud until until, until it started raining really it was um it was it was a lot of fun it was for the most part it was it was hugely enjoyable i i mean i struggled more than the others really i think because of because i was the 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 songwriter i think i i was aware of the of the pressure to 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 come up with hits and their idea of hits and my idea were not necessarily the same thing. Um, because on the first album, you have the great, is it Hugh Jones? Yeah. And he's got the most amazing CV, hasn't he? He's just like, yeah. he's just gold. And your experience with that was brilliant, wasn't it? I, yeah, I, I loved Hugh. I, I, I think he was such, a, such an example. I, I think I think a great example is as I, I was I was very fairly reluctant to work with him on that record. There were other people that I preferred, but but the um the R A N R manager was was very keen to work with Hugh largely because of his C V. Yeah. And and yeah, in the end I, I I just loved his work ethic and it's it, his work ethic is essentially like there are 24 hours in the day, so that's so that's they're the ones we're gonna work. And um yeah, he would it was back in the days where where you could chain smoke in a recording studio, so that's what he did. It was like smoking, 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 working, 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 never sleeping, and um, yeah, and 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 really a really great temperament, very very uh, even tempered. He never he never seemed to get cross, even though he didn't sleep ever. Because um, I, I have spoke to a few people who've mentioned, you know, working with him and, and, and your description in the book was exactly the same, that you just thought, how is he not going to, you know, how is he still alive with this diet of yeah. uh, not great food, just smoking and just working all the time? Yeah. But producing just amazing albums. I mean, he was just an amazing character. He's still alive, isn't he, I believe? I've, I have not heard anything of Hugh Jones for... I mean, so many years, maybe twenty years, um, and it's it, which is which is strange because I, I I'm I'm so fond of him and I and I think of him often. I I should probably reach out and see see how he's doing. Yeah. Um, but yeah, he he definitely, yeah, he was he was a great person to 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 start making proper records with in in a proper setting. I think I think way more than someone who who was like one of those you know a flaky vibe man who you know, who, who maybe didn't have the same kind of work ethic. I, I, I've, I've always considered myself to be quite the, the blue collar rock star, if you will. So I think, I think just someone who's willing to put in the hours, I think was really, was really quite inspirational to. So when, when you heard the album, this, this is where I stand, were you pleased with the results of it? Did you think this is good? I'm enjoy I've enjoyed what, what this sounds like. Unlike, um, was it Ian Curtis from Joy Division who hated you know when he heard Martin Hannett's kind of um, first album that he did, you know they, he did for the band, right? Um, at the time, at the time, I loved it. I, I, I was, I remember being like very emotional when when we had the um, the first playback um, at mastering. So you know that so that's the first time you listen to the record from start to finish, like finished as it is. Like so, it's been mixed, it's been mastered. This is the record. And they put it on the big speakers. They play it loud. And you sit there and you listen to the whole thing all the way through, and I, I'm, and for me that that felt like a massive achievement because, I, it seemed it seemed like I like I'd been wanting to make a proper record for my whole life, and then this was the first time where it's a proper record we made with a proper producer in a real studio on a proper label, and it sounded it sounded big and like you know like a like the rock record I've always wanted. Listening to it now, I really don't like it at all. But I think that's largely to do with, you know, I would I would say maturity, but but you but you know you you might say it's just like a change of in, in taste really. Yeah. And 
the way the way that I the way that I write and record and play now is very different to how it was then. But yeah, there, there were there are some things about there are some things about the very early records that we made that I that I still kind of I sort of quite admire the ambition of those young people who yes. <laughs> put put some put some sort of some strange things on on onto tape that I that I maybe wouldn't wouldn't even think of now. I I, I much prefer the second Easy World album to the first. I, I feel like it's more uh it's kind of more interesting I think but uh, this is the kill the last romantic yeah because your experience from right from your book you were saying you didn't enjoy the the whole you know going into the studio the producer wasn't quite so nice you know such a great vibe the, it was, the hours weren't so cool yeah it was it was hard I I I struggled a bit more with um with with the producer David Costin, who who I who I absolutely love, I adore him. I think he's he's wonderful, and and I think that and I think the job he was doing on the record was very very good, but I think I think I'm a very difficult person to 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 work with uh, for producers. I think I'm quite uh, opinionated, but at the same time, I'm aware of the that I don't want to I don't want to tread on the toes of of the producer I I tend to I tend to sulk a little bit I think if uh, certainly on on that session I I felt like it was getting away from me a little bit and so I think I I think I retreated into myself a little bit I found it you know I I find it difficult to um to compromise and to and to work with people I always have like I don't I don't I don't co-write comfortably and I, I don't co-produce comfortably either. And, and I'm not very comfortable relinquishing control. So if someone else is producing my record, like it, it really just, it feels uncomfortable in that, you know, I sort of want to be making all the calls myself. Yeah. And the idea that ultimately somebody else gets to make those calls feels a bit wrong to me. And I think, and I think because we, because David Costa and I had had some sort of different ideas about some things, I think I found it difficult in that respect. With hindsight, I think he was probably right about all of them. But you know, I was I was young and 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 yeah, opinionated and idealistic and 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 headstrong and and stubborn. Yeah, God, there you go. It happens, doesn't it? Did you had when did you decide that was going to be it for the band, you know, and you were going to go in a different direction? Was that during the recording of the album or when when it was finished? It was it was afterwards. I mean, it was it was while we were on the tour. Like I say, it was it was I, I got the Tom Waits DVD and I was like, ah, we're done here. This is this is uh, this is not this is not going to going to be for me. And so I think I think the the last we had a we had a maybe a tour over the summer and then a few festival performances booked, which were the last things to do. And, and we'd, we promised to put out another single off that, but well, not off the record. We, you know, I had to write another song to put out as a single. And, and, and by that point we knew the label was going to get swallowed up and ultimately closed down. We knew the band wasn't going to get picked up for a third album. All of that stuff was obvious. It seemed, it seemed like, like the very natural place to, draw a line yes because we because we were definitely about to to be unsigned again and and obviously that then then you get into the you know the the struggle of I guess trying to find a new label or or doing the whole independent thing and I, I I didn't really have the um I didn't have the fight in me to do that with the band again whereas I did I did have the uh I definitely did have the energy to to do something very different Yes. Did the did the other two members? Did they also feel like they were? It was time to kind of move on and do other things. No, distinctly less so. I think I think they would have, they they would have stuck. They would have stuck with it. I think. Um, yeah. So so it was it was definitely my. You know, I I I wanted to go, and they didn't. You know, they didn't want want to the band to split up. Oh, that's so awkward, isn't it? Mostly people all had enough. You know, there's a sort of 
just that kind of, I don't know, five years together and also a bit of a lack of money and everyone's just thinking, God, I'm just exhausted. I just need to do something else. This isn't quite working as we wanted it to. So mostly it's kind of a nice feeling that everyone's gone, going in the same direction. But obviously there are occasions when it doesn't always um, line up, does it? Yeah, I mean, it would it would have been nice had we all kind of gone. That was that was a great ride, you know. No hard feelings. Let's let's do some other stuff, which was kind of how I felt felt about it. I, I think, but um, you know, it, it it was it was definitely the right thing to do. Whether I mean, I know I know the others didn't think that at the time. I, I don't know whether they would think that now, but it, it definitely it definitely had reached a point where it was it was the right time to, to do something else. Yes. So at this stage, when you decided to go solos, were you, had you sort of felt confident that this was a good, you know, this was going to be your next direction to go in? Yeah, I, I, I did. And not, not sort of commercially or anything. It, it wasn't about, oh, I think I can, I can, you know, get a deal doing this or, or have a career doing this. It was more just, I, I was, I was writing loads and loads of songs and I was really excited at writing songs again. I, I, it felt like a really, there was like a new energy. Like it, it had been a slog the last, the last year of, of, of being in Easy World. It felt like a bit of a slog and there was a lot of pressure to, to come up with the hit, whatever that meant. And then to, to remove that pressure entirely and just kind of go, well, I'm going to, I just want to write songs that are, what I want to do and, and, they, and they didn't have to fit the format of a, of a three-piece guitar band as well was was great you know I could arrange them any way I wanted to um yes. so you got you got on, a, a, on onto a label and did you and you recorded all this was this in your own studio you recorded was it I sincerely apologize uh well I mean you can call it studio or you can call it like my bedroom you know it was <laughs> yeah it was it was there was no there was no studio involved it was it was um I was very fortunate to essentially be uh house sitting for for a friend of mine his his, his parents moved to Kenya for work and, and they just let me look after their house and so I I set up a studio there and and made made the made my album there yes. uh, it was it was it was yeah, joyous I was gonna say, it, it 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 came together so well and, and you know um, State of the Union has just been you know it's such a great song so did that give you a lot of confidence that you'd made the right decision and this was going to be your next path? Oh yeah I didn't I didn't even think about it after that it was it, it, was, it felt so natural and and like writing came so easily recording was really enjoyable because I was learning more about how to how to record myself and to and to and to make production choices and and and, and the technical side of it, I was just in, it, the the journey was great. I felt I was really growing as a writer and as a as a as a producer and a musician. And yeah, I, I just really you know, it was yeah the happiest the happiest time of my whole life. Yeah, <laughs> that's fantastic. And you also do a cover of a Smith song, don't you, on the second album? Yes, yeah, which is one of our favorites. So by then you'd become, you know, you were supporting, you know, lots of incredible people like, you know, Suzanne Vega and Elvis Costello. Who was? I know you mentioned Tom Waits before. Was there anybody else that you were beginning to sort of become influenced by? I think around that time it was it was like the the really major kind of American old men, I suppose. Bob Dylan, Tom Waits, Neil Young, Bruce Springsteen, uh, Leonard Cohen. Canadian, obviously, like Neil Young, but um, you know I, I, those guys. They're like the the heavyweight old guard North American songwriters. I were were mostly my thing, and and I suppose the 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 I was listening to some of the sort of younger pretenders to 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 those crowns, like Bright Eyes and Ryan Adams. So I, I kind of I sort of saw myself in in that in that kind of uh, yes. And that kind of your, your spirit was in Laurel Canyon, wasn't it, really? Yeah, I, I think so. <laughs> yes. Yeah, well, it's tempting, isn't it? I mean, you know, I've, I had sort of, you know, people like Neil Young and Joni Mitchell. I know you didn't mention Joni Mitchell, but those lyrics are just always kind of quite something. So you must have been sort of getting your, yeah, your vocal, your not vocal, your, your sort of lyrical content was starting to sort of come out. Because I just noticed on your last album, it's very... It's very melancholic, isn't it? It's got a, a very heavy vibe to it. 
which reminded me, I don't know, you know, if, you know, if I'm even close, but I do, in the old days, in the, I don't know, about 10, 20 years ago, I used to love watching these Woody Allen films, you know, like Annie Hall and Manhattan, when autumn and winter was coming. And there was this kind of really kind of vibe in, uh, on, the, on the last album that you had that sort of evoked a lot of that kind of memory, really. I didn't know if you were sort of channeling some of that kind of spirit of, um, yes, your deeper, darker felt. Uh, when you, when you say the last album, do you mean do you mean Love and Death? Or, yes, that's right. the one. Which of course is the name of a Woody Allen movie. Um, God, that's so true. <laughs> but even it, that said, I I, I I don't think I was I don't think I was channeling Woody Allen. If if anything, maybe maybe the um, the last couple of Leonard Cohen records before he died, I, I really really enjoyed. I, I I thought his his record "You Want It Darker," which dealt essentially was a, as a record about the process of him dying. Yeah. I, I suppose maybe maybe from that I I I took some of the the themes of of mortality uh, and, and wanted to sort of write some stories yeah, about that. I guess it struck me as you know people write songs about love all the time but but death is something that's kind of more more taboo and as I like to challenge myself when it comes to writing songs I I, I want to write songs about things that are quite difficult to discuss so death seemed death seemed like a like a pretty good pretty good choice and I I suppose I was thinking about it a bit because I I but by the time he died I was such a huge Leonard Cohen fan he's he's you know, as as a lyricist, he is my absolute favourite, and um, not not that I was necessarily you know wanting to uh, you know copy him or anything. That that said, the the the, the track um, "Prison Tattoo," I, I I definitely was was feel like I was flexing a Leonard Cohen muscle on on writing that one. Yes, absolutely. I mean, there was that there was Leonard, and then there's David Bowie's uh, "Black Star," which again. Mm. Is, yeah, is quite amazing because again they they're definitely not sort of singing about sort of making love all night, are they? Like people yeah. did when they were sixteen, <laughs> which is an obscene thought, really. Um, <laughs> but yeah, suddenly it's like, oh my god, everyone's you know talking about sort of the the end and what does that mean? Yeah. Also on that album, and I don't know if I caught this right, but do you is there a line from a Carry On film that suddenly appears? Yeah. Infamy, infamy. Everyone's got it in for me. Yes, I thought I was like, oh, and then I just again that kind of made me smile. I thought, blimey, that did I just hear that right? Anyway, yes. Yeah, so did you? Um, and yes, but you were a little bit too young for the Carry On films. Was that something that you thought? I know. I, I I grew up with the Carry On films. <laughs> I mean, they they may have been made before my time, but but certainly you know, like they they were on TV like throughout throughout my youth. So I have I have oh. a fairly have a fairly uh, yeah fulsome familiarity with, with the with the carry on. Oh, genre. excellent! Oh, I'm pleased I, I didn't you know because it always what, well, my favourite line was the whip it in or you know I don't know, <laughs> <laughs> which I just I just you know it's so childish and I still yeah. love carry on screaming. So did you make this album? Was this the the album that you made during sort of I assume during the lockdown, the dreaded two years of lockdown? No, Love and Death actually predates that. We we made it in twenty nineteen, um, and then and then essentially it it got it had it got shelved by by lockdown largely because of the nature of of how it was recorded, sort of live with a band. That was that was sort of how I wanted to to tour the record as well. So in, until such time that we could actually all be in a room together and, and make music you know I had to shelve it so in the meantime I recorded my other record May You Live in Interesting Times so that was recorded under house arrest uh, right. Jesus Christ this is complicated isn't it I mean yeah. has, did you did you sort of feel inspired during lockdown or did that slightly finish you off no I, I felt I felt massively inspired and and I, I've I've not met many other writers who were a lot of them were just Seem seem to say that oh they just they just stagnated and couldn't you know couldn't drag any words or music out of themselves. I I was yeah I, I mean I was probably the most productive I've been since I quit the band and and started writing songs back then. I was I was writing songs every day and and coming down here to the bottom of the garden where my studio is and and recording them. 
Right. And yeah, and, and kind of made a, made an album by accident. It wasn't my intention to make it, but then I I I, I wrote all these songs, and they seemed to sort of hang together really, kind of more coherently than than most of the other records I've made. So, so yeah, so that that became became an album that came out in March, and then. Right. So this "May You Live in Interesting Times" was your lockdown album, which has that track six feet apart, which is obviously. Yeah. Ah, the social distancing. It's all making sense. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So so that album's all about COVID and, and Donald Trump, essentially. That 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 covers most of the songs on it. Oh, um just, just like you there. Um, yes, and two shots, the wall has come between us. Right. It's all your Donald Trump and, and COVID period. Yeah. Oh, Jesus. Well, that's good to get it out there, isn't it, really? Yes. Okay, I got it. So, was this one with just you, or did you have the band recording bits as, as well? Uh, so, May Live in Interesting Times, I, I recorded entirely on my own, uh, with the exception of one of my friends, who's a wonderful guitar player, um, recorded some guitar from his home in Nashville and like sent it to me. So, we did that sort of by. You know, by by sending tracks forwards and backwards, and Beth Rowley did some some vocals on it as well. Right. But other than that, it's it's just me. Right. That's because before that, about ten years ago, you did an album called Charge, and this is the one that was produced by a different James Brown. Um, but this was this was one that sort of was also one of your most successful albums as well, wasn't it? Charge. Yes. Um. I mean, I don't really know. I suppose it was successful in the sense I think it's a good album. I mean, I, I don't know that, you know, it, it wasn't even in any shops. So it's not like it's not like it was flying out of record stores. I honestly don't know. It, it's it's one of the things about me. I couldn't I couldn't tell you what my sales figures are or streaming numbers. I don't really care to know these things. They're not. Yeah, you know, I know it's a cliche, but that's that's not. I don't consider that any measure of success for me success is like I think it's a, I think it's a really well put together record and I think I think it sounds it sounds good the songs do the job that I wanted them to do that's that's success for me everything else is marketing and I don't much care for marketing no Jesus Christ I know did you ever see the Bill Hicks sketch about marketing is there any marketers here kill yourself you <laughs> You have to see it. You know, yeah, it. I, I I will look that up as soon as our conversation finishes. <laughs> Just, you know, because it's like, oh, you know, you guys can always find the buck, you know. Oh, you've got the anti, you know, the anti-capitalism. We love that buck, you know. Oh, you've got this. Oh, that's the great buck, that is. You know, it's like, yeah. oh, fuck off, kill yourself now. Just get away from us, you know. It's just too much, isn't it? But then you did have a sing single that was kind of a massive hit for Johnny, wasn't it? Johnny Halliday. Halliday. Yeah. How did that come about? completely by accident it's like everything happens by accident like I have no I've never had a plan for anything these things sort of kind of fall out of the sky um essentially it came it came about from from trying to get dropped from my publisher so I, I had a publishing deal which had expired and so but you don't just the way it works with with these things is you don't just the contract doesn't just end you have to you have to let them know that you want to get out of it right and so my manager sent a, sent a, the necessary letter to my publisher saying, which essentially says like, if you want to if you want to pick me up for another album, you need to pay me in advance, knowing full well they weren't going to do it, or, you know, write back to confirm that our that our contract is terminated. You know, the, just doing the doing the due right. diligence. And I think I think they they emailed back saying, oh sorry, we didn't know we even had your publishing catalogue. Which, which is not surprising because they've done fuck all with it for the last like 10 years. And they go, oh, well, well, yeah, before we before we part ways, we'll just we'll just pitch it to something. Uh, Johnny Halliday's looking for songs. We'll pitch him, we'll pitch him one of your songs. And they did. And 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 Johnny, and more importantly, apparently his wife really liked it. And so they commissioned a French lyric, he recorded it, put it on his record. It was a single and it, it was a hit and the record was the album was was a number one and and it was it was like yeah a bit a bit of a a bit of a comeback for for Johnny Alliday but yeah it just it just came out of that it, it was it was like an absent-minded oh I suppose we'll do a perfunctory job of pitching one of your songs to see if someone wants to record it like say having had my catalogue for a decade and not even knowing they had it 
So, um, so yeah. So the music industry, how does that kind of work? Can you explain? (laughs) Because it's one of those great mysteries, isn't it? How does the you know ownership of music, publishing, how does this, how do these two things operate? Well, essentially, you make your deal with the devil. You you sell ownership of your songs in exchange for, for a bunch of money. The money is more useful than the ownership of your songs for the most part, because the songs only become valuable if if <laughs> if they become valuable. And mm-hmm. most songs don't become valuable. So therefore, in the early stages, if someone says, well, I'll give you £20,000 in exchange for every song you write for the next three years, you think about it and you go, that's probably a good deal, so you take it. Right. And then it's up to them to to decide what they want to do with your songs or not. So so they paid me some money to own my songs. And then it seems just like owned them, but didn't do anything with them, which is their right. Yes. It, you know, obviously in all that time, they could have been, they could have been using the songs that, that I wrote that they owned to advertise toothpaste and McDonald's burgers or to, you know, to try and get people to put in their films or to try and get French rock stars to do cover versions of, they just didn't do it, which is their right. <laughs> Again, it, you know, it would have been beneficial to me and to them had they actually done it, but they didn't have to. And you know, does that then mean that when, as in this case, they actually use it, does that mean you benefit at all? Or do they say, God, that was, that was quite lucky, you know, because we paid you that money and that was the mm. deal. Or do you then say, oh, or is there a part of the contract that means that you would then get a commission from, you know, the success of Johnny's kind of cover of your track? Yeah, so, so the way the money works is they set it against your balance. So any money that comes in, they, they recoup the money, whatever advance they've given you first before you see a penny. Right. And thereafter, once, once you've paid off whatever debt, they perceive you have to them then then you work on a whatever the contract says your split is so usually you also the the other thing of course is is they they have very clever ways of doing their accountancy so that you never actually officially have paid back the money they've given you so it's so essentially they, they just they just keep all the money forever Again, I don't have a problem with that necessarily. Mm. For, the, for the most part, you, you presume that the advance they give you is the only money you're ever going to see. And, and that's how I always have, have dealt with it. Yes, I would imagine. I think quite a few people I spoke to just say, you know, like, don't just get the best deal, give them the album, just say that's fine. I'm not even thinking about you know, what, anything else, you know, yeah. and, and just keep it tidy like that. Does that mean then since then... Since that time, you own all the music that you make. Have have you sort of kept that kind of ownership and publishing? Um, I don't really know or remember. I'm so disinterested in the in the mechanics of the music industry thing. I, as far as I'm, as I think I think I own everything for the last couple of albums, certainly. Yeah, but it. But you know the the ownership of it doesn't really mean anything. <laughs> it's it's like it's not a particularly valuable commodity. So with so, the last two albums, are these on your own label? Have you you know are these self published that you're sort of well not self published but put together by yourself? Yeah, I mean the, the, well they are in the sense that there is no label. So yeah, so it, it's nowadays it, it's not particularly difficult to you know to upload your own songs to the various different digital services and to, to manufacture physical that you sell at your gigs. It's, it's, yeah, it's, it's, pre- it's pretty easy to do. I mean, record labels are at the lower end of the food chain are pretty pointless. Like there's not really much that they can do for you yeah. that you can't do for yourself. The only thing I suppose is promotion. And most of that is utterly ineffective. So so, so there's not really much point in 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 doing any of it. Yeah. And unless yeah. unless you have until you have half a million pounds to spend on promotion, there's probably not much point in doing any. I would say. Yeah. And when did you decide to write the book? How you, um, how to nearly make it in the music industry? I choose this. 
this classic that was recommended. I, I think it was a member of the Concept Angels said, God, yeah, I, I, you know, I really recommend this book. You should buy it. Oh, OK, then I'll do that. Oh, was, it, was that Kevin Bacon? Yes. Well, he, he features in the, in the book quite, uh, yeah, he's, he's, he's quite central to uh, the, 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 the difficult second album. Uh, that I made. He was he was one of the producers on it, and wow. um, it was it was yeah it was not it was it was it was not an enjoyable process that, and I feel I feel dreadful for for the how what a drag it must have been for Kevin and Jonathan who were producing that. I was okay. I was not in a very good place at that point, but um, yeah, read read the book. You'll you'll find out. Yeah, um, I think it was him who recommended. He said, yeah, right, one of the best books on me. So I was like, oh my gosh, I'll jump out. Then. Thank you, Kevin. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> anyway, I, I, I wrote I wrote the book, like I say, because I'd been I'd been sort of it had been ten years since I since I quit my job in a record store to to go on tour and be a musician, and I'd never had to get another day job since, and that seemed like a real achievement to go ten years, especially you know when you never actually were particularly successful, you know never sort of famous or had any big hits it seemed like that was kind of an achievement to, to have just stuck it out for that long and I and I I didn't really have any um you know I hadn't written any songs for a bit I didn't have a an idea for a, for a new record and so I thought I'm, I'm gonna write write a book just essentially throw down some anecdotes it seemed like it had been an interesting 10 years yeah a, a lot had happened and and it was around the same time that I think uh, Keith Richards brought out his book a little earlier that year, and and I and I got his book, and it was all it's all you know drug busts on the Canadian border and tax exiles and, and you know all, all those stories of of glamour and and drugs and private jets and and I was like that's great and everything, but there's there are other there are other stories to be told in the life of a musician, and and they involve you know travel lodges and pot noodles and 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 trying to you know doing it doing it a different way so I kind of thought those stories are are equally interesting and no less valid so I'll write some of those down yeah no I just I remember now because I was looking at your American bit <clears throat> reading through that and sort of remembering when we did road trips and you just go to the cheapest places and you name all the places and yeah. occasionally you think oh, I would love to go to a best western but that's going to be a hundred dollars and we can get somewhere like motel six or eight for sort of forty dollars and it's like okay yeah. let's stick with the forty dollars but it's going to be a horrible mattress <laughs> i did i didn't know if i if i mentioned in the book but one but one place we, we stayed was uh it, it was a tiny motel next to an enormous like porno warehouse where they did they you know they saw like vibrators and dirty magazines and stuff and there was this and there was this it was one of those like motels where you can get a room by the hour if you want to mm -hmm. and it was I think it was twenty four dollars for a for a hotel room for the night, and <laughs> and and when you when you shut the door, there was like still an inch of daylight that you could see along the side of the door. And it was one of the ones where you park right outside your your motel, so it's just like open to the elements. Anyway, it was it was it was incredibly cheap, and it wasn't at all nice. But um, this these were the adventures we were having, and I I kind of I don't know I I, I kind of I kind of loved the. The, almost the challenge of finding the shittiest place to stay it was it was yeah it was a good time I was I was young and that didn't really bother me that much and, that, and then nowadays I had a really I just just snapped one day and I stayed in this hotel and the carpet was wet and it's like well, how is the carpet wet in a hotel room <laughs> and since since then I've 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 must confess I've been leaning towards like a Marriott or something like utterly luxurious when I've toured in America, which is probably why I don't tour in America anymore, because it's, it's been losing and hemorrhaging money every time I do it. Yes, no, I do remember once thinking we should try an independent and I got out, it was night time, drove into the, you know, the car park, which was quite big, and then went to see the giant bloke with this, you know, he was behind a cage and there was a massive dog and I said, oh, could I have a look at the room first? And I went and had a look and it was like, I can't stay in there. I'm, I'm just, I'm scared. I'm just gonna have to, you know, got back in the car. You know, went. Thanks. I think we'll just try another place. Bye. You know, it was just like, it was just like the whole vibe. It was just a bit too real. And I thought, this is where we're gonna die, isn't it? I can't. Yeah. You know, we're gonna have to just splash another twenty dollars or thirty. So, um, 
Yeah, so you, you've done America. Yeah, you must feel really it would be nice to go and do it again and, and sort of reconnect with your fans. Yeah, it's, it's, been, a, it's been a long time. I mean, even, even without COVID, it, it's, it's so hard to go and tour in America. Like getting a visa to, to go and play shows over there is really, really kind of prohibitively expensive and a lot of hassle. Like it's, um, yeah, unless, I suppose, unless you have the infrastructure of, of um, like a record label or agency booking you to come over, it's, it's just really hard to get, to do it in a legal fashion. Yes. So, um, and how's Europe been since the wonderful world of Brexit? Have you managed to sort of tour Europe at all? I've never toured Europe ever. No, not before or, or since Brexit. I don't have no idea why. It's um it's 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 very odd. Like yeah, not even when I had you know, when I when I was signed to Sony worldwide, they had me in America and Australia, but like yeah, never never so much as set a foot in, in Europe to go and play music, which is kind of odd. I mean, I I I I thought that maybe, you know, the Dutch and the Scandinavians would, would have been kind of into it. But uh, yeah, we, we never we never got that chance. And I suppose since I could have done it under my own initiative, but as you may be learning, I don't have a great deal of that when it comes to matters of career. I just sort of like to <laughs> aimlessly blunder my way through it and, and hope that things just happen by accident, which seems to be working all right so far. Yes, well, absolutely. I don't know. Was there a band called Shelley Ann Orphan that came from your, was it Bournemouth or... No oh. area, I don't know, but they they were one of those very sort of interesting and slightly peculiar bands from the eighties. And they, and I think the Italian is often the case that with bands like that, and they often have one country will really take to them, like Spain or Italy. Yeah, and it's for some unknown reason, there's you know they have no other fans anywhere, but one country will yeah. adore them, and then they'll find some rich Italian who'll say, "Oh, come and record a new album if you want," because I've just made billions somewhere down the line. So um. I think That'd be nice. Have... But I, I take Italy as a as a territory. I'm a, I'm a big yeah, fan. So, you'll have to... so if anybody needs to find out more, your book is available from online, obviously. Yeah. Um, it was printed by Amazon, which I think is quite sweet. And um, yes, but you've got I don't think with printed people. by Amazon. I hope not. Yeah, it was got this. It has this kind of thing, doesn't it? I think they just kind of. I, I can't see that. It's just. I'm just it just says that. printed by Amazon. Does it? I think it's because if you order it now online, they probably don't, it doesn't exist. They just go, oh, he, we bought a copy, you know, someone wants a copy and they just go, Woof. so that has a certain vibe, feel to it, if you know what I mean. I am, I am confounded by that. I, I, I don't, as far as I'm aware, they don't have the right to do that. They don't pay me anything. Oh, don't they? I think as far as I'm aware, that is utterly like theft, what they're doing there. Like, <laughs> I've, I, I didn't know you could get it on Amazon. Like, I don't know, I don't know, I don't know what the fuck that's all about. Yeah, so well, you'll, you'll have to kind of have a look at Amazon and find, well, they, you, you've definitely sold a copy this year to me. Well, they've sold a copy. <laughs> <laughs> so I think I must have bought it, I must have bought it online. Anyway, so anybody, and you've got live dates, haven't you? Yes. So if anyone wants to find your live dates, I'll just have a look actually, and then I can tell you when I bought it. And then you go, oh yes, is it really? Um, um, uh, David Ford. Wood. Yes, it's on, it's 10 pounds on Amazon. Wow. I purchased it, oh, that was last year, I just bought it really. There you go. There you go. And you've got some great reviews from different people. Great read, great read, great insight. Good fun, interesting read. Lots of good feedback. Lots of, <laughs> so, so Amazon have printed and sold lots of my books to lots of people. <laughs> I, see, I, I'm this this is an insight into into my into my business acumen. I don't know. I've no idea how the fuck they've got my book. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't give it to them. All I didn't right. say they could sell it. I don't know what's going on. Yes, you'll have to have a, you'll have to look later. Um, so yes, and but live dates as well. Is it all available on your website with the with the album? Is it available just as a download? Oh, and by the way, the new album. The album is also on CD and vinyl. And I have to say, it is brilliant. I do Thank really, you. really recommend it. I've really enjoyed it, even though it was a bit sort of 
heavy in places. Yeah, well, it's, 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 you know, London. it's... It's in the title, isn't it? Exactly, yeah. <laughs> not, not for the faint of heart. You know, it's, it's, I suppose, I was going to say, it has, got some, it has got some upbeat moments, but even the upbeat moments are probably kind of angry. So, um, yeah. There you, go, there you go. Oh, and just last thing, if you could have whispered something to your 16-year-old self, Stardner, is there anything that you would think, yes, I must do that, or I would have told myself that? I probably would say just don't take the whole damn thing so seriously and say yes more. L largely, largely say yes more just to be more positive, but also I, I think one thing I didn't, one thing I didn't sort of realise at the time was that when people who are at record labels say that they admire your artistic integrity, that's not true. They, they want you to, they want you to suck up to them and, and say, yeah, say that all their ideas are brilliant. And they, they don't want you to be uh, a, you know, headstrong and single-minded and focused artist. They want you to do as you're told. Even, even though when they say, we see you as the next Bob Dylan, what they mean is we want you to do what we want you to do. And, and to an extent, I should have been, I sh what I would say to my younger self is like, let them think that, say yes, and then still do your own thing anyway, but let them think it was their idea all along. Uh, right. Yes. Because because I was I was always quite I was often quite hostile to to the record label interventions because I, I saw it as I, I sort of saw them as sort of the enemy, which I shouldn't have done because obviously, you know, they they wanted to work with me and they wanted to put my records out. But like I I was always very suspicious of them wanting to kind of mess with my vision if you will and I, I should have been I should have been a bit more cool and friendly with with them at the time and I think I would have made more friends that way I think people people found me quite difficult to work with because I wanted because because I I, I thought it was important to to do things the way I wanted them done yeah. which I don't think was wrong but at the same time I, I should have had the necessary gift of diplomacy i suppose to be able to make them think that that i was listening and 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 agreeing with them instead of telling them to go fuck themselves <laughs> and did you have you ever been in touch with the other members of the band at all just to sort of occasionally a, a little um taylor the the bass player uh she came and played a a, a charity gig that i did if, i mean we're, we're going back a, a lot of years now um, so that that was the last time that we that we played music together. I don't think I've seen her since either. Um, and I bump into the drummer occasionally, but, yeah. but you know we're not. To be honest, we we weren't particularly close before or during being in the band, and, and we're not now either. No, no, no. You you talk about the drummer and the ba and and the amount of space they need. Yeah, that's classic. That bit about having to find the symbol as well. Honestly, they're, they're right over there. I still use them all the time. I'm, I'm on like sort of, what, eight albums I've made with those same symbols. They're fine. <laughs> they're absolutely fine. <laughs> it's a great book. It is such a good read. So, um, yes. Uh, sorry I thought you were saying that, talking about Amazon. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, look, David, thank you ever so much. If you want, I can always give you the list, uh, link to this and you can always use it elsewhere. Great, yeah. Lovely. But look, thanks again for your time and um, loving the album. So um, all the best. Thank you, David. Thanks a lot. And uh, bye -bye. I'm so sorry I was so late. No, that's fine. It's all, all good. Bye. OK, bye-bye. OK, that was me in conversation with David Ford talking about his life in music. If you want to know any more information, he has got a very good Facebook page, which is, no, he hasn't, a website. There you have it. At davidfordmusic.com. So just go and check it out. It's all there. He says checking it. It is. Yes, it's there. It's good. So uh, do find him and uh, go and see him live and buy his records. Anyway, this has been the C86 show. Sorry, a little bit about the technical issues. But um, yeah, that's live. You can, um, if you want, you can contact me on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. Just do C86 show. All these have been archived. That's on Spotify, iTunes, Podbeam. Have a great week. Stay safe.